What's up, everybody? Welcome to a very special live Arc Junkies podcast. I am your host, Jimmy McKnights, and the gentlemen to my left need no introduction, but we're going to introduce them anyway. Mr. Bob Moffitt from Weld.com, Mr. Jody Collier from Welding Tips and Tricks, and also Mr. Ian Johnson from Big Tire Garage. Let's give these guys a round of applause for being here today. Bob, I want to start with you since you're right next to me. What are some of the skills gaps that you see people running into in the industry, and what do you think they could do to prepare themselves for that? Good question. Really good question. Is this thing on? Yeah, you got to hold it up to your face. Oh, I got it. Okay. Skill sets. Yes. Um, this kind of followed up on a question last night you and I were talking about, about certifications and qualifications, uh, and something that I demonstrated earlier was... Um, you know, no, no codes and procedures, or at least know the workmanship standards of what you need to be performing your work to. Understand them, understand the parameters around them. Uh, you know, and that's you need to have that background knowledge of processes, gases, the science of welding, and then the art of welding. The art is your actual physical weldment. The science is understanding what you need to be doing the chemistry right. metallurgy and gases and stuff like that so right now uh jody what are the attributes shared by the best welders and what do you think is the proper mindset that you need to have wow kabam right yeah that's a real deep we're getting deep <laughs> yeah, I've heard of that. yeah a friend of mine that roy that i do the our podcast with yeah. made a comment he got some really good advice early on as a welder. Uh, have a machinist mindset. Yep. You know, pay attention to detail. You know, if the, the tolerance is, is a plus or minus an eighth, maybe you shoot for plus or minus, you know, a 32nd or, or less. So, so set your standards really high. Right. So that's a good attribute. Having that attention to detail, you know, just good work ethic, showing up early, uh, putting out an adequate balance of quality and quantity usually one or the other is not enough you got to do both you know um, if you can't stay off your phone maybe leave it in the freaking car yeah that's, yeah. A, that's a big one yeah, it really that's a is problem now yeah. but you know just being a good worker being the kind of uh, employee or kind of welder that you would want to hire that would make you money right on. Ian yes. <laughs> what is a good way to turn your passion into a career and I mean what's realistic about that what's what's good settings that you can go with you know I don't know that that, that is a good question as well the the whole idea of everyone says you know if you turn your your passion into your career you're not gonna work a day in your life and that that's a lie um, basically if you turn your passion into your career feedback you turn your passion into a career you basically trade your uh, 9 to 5 for a 24 7 yeah um, but I think it's a good thing. I think everyone's passionate about something, and no matter what it is. And I think uh, it, it, it's, you know, that whole idea of turning your passion into a career or your hobby into your career. You know, for most of us out here, any type of tradesperson, a lot of us just sort of relate. It, it's like I was a mechanic. I'm still a mechanic. You know, I was a teacher. I'm still a teacher. Uh, I may have a different job now. I may do different things, but I'm still a mechanic. You're still a welder. You're still a welder. I think that just the nature of the trades themselves. You, you are in that boat already. You might not know it, but you're already there. Mm -hmm. You hear a lot about uh, you know, different welding pay, okay? From, from entry level to, to top 10% of the welders that are out there. What do you feel is a good starting wage for somebody just getting into the industry? Who's jumping on that one? Come on, jump. That's open $1 to everyone. $1 million dollars a year. No, more <laughs> than it is right now. Yes, I, yeah. I couldn't agree more. That is a problem. You you, you spoke with, with Josh Welton, our friend over there, yep. about skills gap versus wage gap. Which one it, is it really? Yes. You know, some of the skills gap could be fixed by uh, improving wages, definitely. Um, so I don't know what, what a good – because because it, welding jobs are so all over the board, I don't think you could say there's one good starting wage, but I do think it needs to come up. I, I could agree. I mean, you, you when you look at it, you see uh, – you know, if you go on Indeed right now and you like look welding jobs, they're 15 to $19 an hour. They want you to have thousands of dollars worth of tools. They want you to work seven days, 12 hours a day. And then you have Amazon coming in and they're paying $15 an hour. Or, you know, burger joints that are out west that are paying $15 an hour. 
And people are like, well, why am I going to go work all these hours and bring in all these tools and have to go through all the schooling when I could just ring somebody up or I could flip a burger and make close to the same wage? I think that's true, but I think one thing that, you know, we had a discussion with that earlier with a, a friend of mine. He was asking, he had a, uh, a young kid working for him, and he was asking, if he, should he get certified? And I grew up in a factory town. So mm-hmm. when I graduated high school, that was way back in 1991, I could go work at Hershey Chocolate, and I could make twenty-one twenty-five an hour. Or I could go be a mechanic, and I could make seven twenty-five an hour to start. So I chose seven twenty-five an hour because I kind of said, you know what, the one thing is, if you're a mechanic, if you're certified, you have that certification, no one can ever take that away. The factory can go away tomorrow, oh, and yeah. it did. And then everyone who was there making twenty-one twenty-five, then they were scrambling for any job. If you have a certification or some type of trade certification or a license or ASE certification like I have, there's always that ability that you're not beholden to just that one burger job or Amazon job because you never know when that stuff's just going to disappear in a heartbeat. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Now, say you get lucky enough to uh, get to the point where you can start your own company, how you mentioned a little bit about that earlier and how you go from putting in the the 40-hour week to now you're working 24-7, you know, basically. Uh, What are some of the other things that you know, someone might not know is going to come their way when they start their own company. I think probably the biggest thing that, that, uh, you know, I've learned or seen from all that my career changes in my life is twofold. Number one, um, you know, and and I think we've talked about it before and and I've heard it talked on many podcasts before. It's, it's the business side of things. Like we talked about it one time on a podcast, Joe, I think that's, that's just the thing is everyone thinks that that's just, you know, I can weld or I can fix a car or I can build something. That's like 10% of a business, you know? Like there's a, all that other 90% of that stuff. And I'm a firm believer that education never ends. You, if the minute that you think you know everything, it's over, you know nothing. So right. the idea to sort of, if, if someone wants to start a business or improve themselves, education is gonna be the sort of the key that's gonna unlock that door. Whether that's learning how to keep your books, balance your accounts, or what's the difference between an LLC and an incorporated company and all that kind of stuff. That's the stuff that comes out of left field and just knocks you over. Right. Time management. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, When it comes to technical education, um, what strides have been made by uh, the educational system that you feel have really benefited the welding industry? Mm. And what has possibly done the negative? This is all you, Bob. Bob. (laughs) Uh, Attributes of the education system. Uh, The attributes in the the education system, uh, I'll speak from my experience, accreditation in higher ed. And I know some people have kind of knocked that at times. But uh, our particular institution, Cali Community College in Kansas, is accredited by North Central in Chicago. And we are also on some projects that are outside of the box of what normal accreditation is. We're, we're doing some stuff or have done some stuff in the past that was dynamic and, and moving forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, as far as career and tech ed, in my department, uh, we have state competency standards. We follow, we teach to the codes. I mean, we're kind of paying attention. We're not reinventing anything for paperwork because we don't have... You know, teachers don't like to do paperwork, but we do. Uh, I think when I first started teaching, I, it was about 80% teaching and 20% paperwork, and now it seems to be just the opposite. You've got to right. got to document everything. But as far as that, uh, as far as that accreditation and the attributes that higher ed is doing, standards, you know, AWS Sense. There's a lot of organizations and, and codes and standards that we follow. So I hope I hope that was a that's a good answer. A, a good yeah, answer. I mean, I'm, there, there's a lot that goes to it and it's behind it. So, Now, for all three of you, um, how important is it for a student that's getting out of welding school to still have an open mind when they get into the field? Because, yes, you, you might have been the rock star in your class, but now when you get out into the field, you realize that you kind of really don't know as much as you thought. And uh, that can kind of deter a lot of guys from, or ladies, from the trade themselves or you know, they can have an open mind and get into it, you know, and, and really start making some money on this. My advice to any student that goes out the door, and I think Ian touched on it already, was, you know, stay off your phone, show up early, stay late, <laughs> ask questions. It's okay for you to use your phone right now. I'm okay with that. No, it's that distraction thing. Yeah. Um, 
I tell my students, you need to shut your mouth and go to work and show up on time for a year. And you got a work record. You can is your work ethic, your work standard. You you want to be dependable, so show up on time. We have some pretty strict companies in our area. There are aircraft, GE engine rebuild, Boeing, Cessna, Raytheon, Bombardier, or in Wichita. And uh, you know, if you hire on, you're going to be pretty pretty strict attendance. So. You know, I always enjoyed showing up on time and being dependable. It infuriates me when I have students that show up late or not at all. Yeah. You know, and that, and it, it's, I think society has kind of gone that way. Maybe I'm, maybe it's just in my area, but, you know, dependability and attendance are a big thing to me. And, I, you know, if you're going to run a business, if I'm going to go work for Ian because he has his successful business going, you want me to show up on time or is it okay if I show up whenever oh, late. I you want. gotta bring me coffee uh, the coffee's okay <laughs> I can do that you know but you want me there on time daily so you can depend and plan your day you know and you probably want me there five days out of five days Usually, yeah. I don't understand people these days they, they've got an excuse for everything and I just I think that's kind of I think that's what's wrong with our workplace sometimes dependability all three of you have really taken your careers to to new heights Okay, um, when you first got into this, I think way back, who was the person that inspired you the most to get into welding and metal fabricating? You want to go one at a, you want to go one at a time? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah this ahead. is for every one of you. Mine was early on. I didn't know what I wanted to be. I was in college, floundering, decided I wanted to work with my hands. College thing wasn't for me. And I happened to move across the street from the welding instructor. So I said, I want to get in auto mechanics program up there where you teach. He said, well, they're full, but I can get you in welding. And that's how I got in welding. So he was, that wasn't the only influence. That was kind of your Mr. Miyagi. Yeah, yeah well, he, he was not only my, you know, the guy that got me in, but he was also my ride every day. <laughs> but he also cared, and he showed me a lot of stuff. And he was uh, very approachable. Mm -hmm. He would share freely what he knew. He wanted me to succeed. And I have to say, now he passed away not too long ago, and uh, I really appreciate what he what he did. I have to say, he had more influence on me than anybody. Yeah. Early on, that first guy that got me involved in it. Right on. Mine's about the same. I was in high school. I was uh, I had the unfortunate uh, situation of my father was my high school principal, and my mother was the vice pre vice principal of the other high school that I could go to. <laughs> so. Uh, when I went into, uh, I knew at 16 years old I wanted to work with my hands and I was going to be a mechanic. That's all I wanted to do when I was 16. So I was, I consider myself fortunate because I knew that I wanted that. I meet so many kids who are just like, I don't know what I want to do. And that to me is, is almost sad and dangerous at the same time. So for me, I knew I wanted to be a mechanic, but when I went into my guidance counselor, I said I want to be a mechanic and she kept saying, well, there's this engineering school and there's this engineering school. And I was like, no, I said mechanic, I want to be a mechanic. And she said, well, you both, we both know that your father's not going to let me show you how to be a mechanic if I want to keep my job at this high school. So I quit the school that afternoon and drove to the other high school, and I walked into the guidance counselor's office, and I said, I want to be a mechanic. And he said, you can be whatever you want to be. He didn't know who I was. But he put me on into the track, and I'm from Canada, so we're a heavy apprenticeship program up there. So I signed my papers right then, 16 years old, started my apprenticeship mechanic. And, uh, and the same thing, friends to this day, when I left auto mechanics to become a shop teacher he was the guy i called because he had gone that route he was a mechanic became a shop teacher became a guidance counselor and so i called him up and i'm not gonna lie i did it for the summers off i mean it's, it's canada it's cold so it's only warm two months out of the year man i want to be outside so i uh became a shop teacher and, and he was the guy who sort of helped me guide my way through that and there, i think that there's all of us probably that have that like one one person it's, it's important uh, my first impression was my father uh, working in the oil fields in Oklahoma, and I had a brother-in-law that was a successful pipe welder. So that's kind of what started me out. My dad needed help, obviously family business, and uh, I told a story to a gentleman back here a minute ago. Uh, they've got a great group of vets that follow us, follow all of us. Thank you very much. And uh, I was telling him that at one point in time I was going to go into the Air Force because I wanted the Air Force. Uh, metallurgy, uh, Ohio State inspection, all that kind of stuff. My dad sat me down. Actually, my mom said, before you sign those papers, you might want to talk to your dad. Uh, what about? You know? right. <clears throat> my dad came in and told me that you know he appreciates me trying to follow in his steps. 
However, he was in the Air Force in World War II and got shot down over Holland, spent 20 months as a POW, and he didn't want me to kind of fall into in that direction, and I'm going, well, remain civilian and uh, get into the oil business with my father. So a right. uh, little bit of a regret, like I, like I said, but uh, I did. I followed, helped him out. Went through uh, a trade school, went on to drafting and design, went on to Oregon Institute of Technology in Klamath Falls, Oregon, worked as a millwright. Uh, one of our lead man was a craftsman of unbelievable skill. His, his woodworking was unbelievable and his layout was impeccable, but he mumbled all the time. So we nicknamed him Mumbles. Yet if you wanted to ask a question, it's better just to watch him and try to learn from him because he was, he was terrible about explaining things, but his, his layout was phenomenal. Is extremely accurate, and so from an early age as a construction millwright and a plywood mill, I I had that instilled in me of that work quality or whatever. Everything that we built as construction millwrights needed to be functional, square and level with the world, and it needed to work. We weren't chasing whistles. That's for the other green hats. You right. know? So <laughs> what, so what we put together, or maintained or rebuilt, needed to be done right. And so I was very fortunate. I worked with my my lead man, my machining instructor, and my welding instructor from the college, and I was on a very small crew at a very young age. I was 20 years old, and I was very fortunate to get on it, and I got on it simply because I had oil field and mechanical and welding experience. So, you touched on it a little bit earlier about uh, you know showing up first and staying late. Um, what sort of advice would you? Uh, offer your 20 year old selves if you could you're talking about you talking about my boy yeah if you could go back if i could go back yes oh man I, you know i don't know I, can, I can't say that you know like i said earlier uh, unless you're working for yourself you know you you need to be dependable Mm-hmm. You know, and I guess if you're working for yourself, you can got some flex time, but you still need to manage your time because things will eat you up. Like you said, things pop up in the day, and it's and it's uh, it gets crazy. Mm-hmm. But uh, dependability and and managing the things that's around you, I I say this often, and it's like with all the advanced technology and all the stuff that we have, your smartphone and and everything around you is technology based computer based and everything and it seems like my life has gotten extremely complicated you know it's like a full time job have you have you tried to get customer service lately <laughs> wow what a nightmare if you got a problem a simple problem and you call into somebody you know yeah, you should be able to get a fix place. have you called your utility company lately you got a gas problem or a water leak or something you're you on the wait phone for 45 for, minutes yeah you're on the phone for half an hour or, or they call put you, you on a recording or call. something <laughs> yeah that to me i mean you know if it's spo- if it if it could be simplified why isn't it you know yep. why are, why are things so complicated i guess i'm old school you know hey it happens it's okay My next yeah go right ahead sir uh, I would have asked more questions. I mentioned I rode back and forth to school with my welding instructor. I was painfully shy till I was into my 20s probably. It's a wonder I got a wife. And I, there, we'd have rides all the way to and from school and no words would be spoken. We were both okay with it because we're both welders. We're both used to putting our head in the bucket for eight hours a day and being okay with that too, right? But I had an encyclopedia of welding knowledge sitting next to me in the in the, in the in the truck and uh, I would have asked him all kinds of questions I would have wore him out you know mm-hmm. but I, I didn't ask and, and I say that because I didn't know a lot of things like I, I didn't I started working with Delta in 1990 but before that I didn't even know they had a jet base or did overhaul on engines there in Atlanta I could have asked and found out I would have asked more questions I would have, I could have, should have communicated more and you mentioned a minute ago about students having an open mind Man, this will open your mind. Fabtech. Oh, 100%. Right? Yeah. Right? Yep. Um, if, 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 you had, if you could have gone to a Fabtech and I could have gone to a Fabtech when we were breaking into the trade, we might have taken different directions. And they worked out okay for both of us, but I didn't know there were so many choices of ways to go. 
I can think of some of the directions I probably would have gone would have been more into the CNC cutting mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And I've watched the technology move along the way. Yeah. I tell a story that, you know, when we started or I started in 1974 till now, what's changed? What has changed? The alloys are still the same. The gases are still the same. We, yeah, we've developed some alloys, some super alloys, but we've kind of figured out how to weld them. But what's actually changed? Technology. It's the, you know, 800 pound, 300 amp machine versus a 300 amp machine that we can pick up and carry. It's a smart little son of a gun, you know, and it's the advanced electronics and how we drive filler metal into the joint and what we're doing to play with the weld puddle and control it. That's what's kind of changed in my perspective anyway. Go right ahead. Well, I mean, Jimmy, that was only like five years ago. I was 20, so (laughs) now it was like 27 years ago. All right. um, I mean, probably the same as Jody. I think I would probably just, well, number one, I'd tell myself when the officer says stop, stop. Um, They don't play. (laughs) But I would say... uh, Probably uh, the first thing I would say to myself would be the honest truth, which I tell everyone, whether it's 20 or 18, even then or now, when I taught high school, is like, you know nothing. And you don't believe it. I, didn't, I thought I knew everything when I was 18, and I didn't have the Internet, so it's even worse now. Um, but I think the truth is, and that's not going to stop. But I think, you know, like you said before, the entry-level guys, it's just you got to hit that humbling wall. You know, we've all hit it when you got the, the – you're either you're – for us, it was a, a tradesman, you know, our, we're apprentices and we have our actual guy who's teaching us or what girl is teaching us and they just let you, they have to let you drop that ball. And, you know, I got an 18 year old right now and my job is just to let him drop the ball all over the place because mm-hmm. he's got to and, that, and, and you have to. So I think I would just, you know, sort of tell myself, you know, just understand A, you think you know everything, but you don't. Um, keep learning and uh, shut up and listen. And, and just like Jody said, ask more questions. Because you right. don't. I mean, I, I, it, it, this is completely off topic, but the first time I painted a car, I was 18 years old. And I remember I walked into the paint store, and I bought the paint, and the guy said, now you got to flash time that off for X number of minutes. You know what that means, right? And I was 18, so I'm like, of course I do. Oh, don't be stupid. Right. I had no idea what that meant, right? <laughs> so I went home, and I took my garage, and I painted that truck. And it was a mess, because I didn't know how to paint a truck. I knew that paint boost got hot, so I like sealed up the entire garage, turned the heat up way high, and I'm in there, and it was not a good scene. And uh, but uh, that's just the stupid mistakes that you make when you're young. That education costs; it either costs money, time, or brain cells. So there's like three things that you pay. So if you can avoid the three and just ask a question, it'll be a lot cheaper in the long run. Right. I try to tell people to get as many feathers in your in your hat as possible when it comes to this stuff. I mean, uh, I'll use Jesse James as, a, as an example. He may be the Pope of welding on Instagram, but he's also arguably one of the greatest bike builders in the world. Uh, now, how much of building the bike is actually welding? About that much. He had to learn all of those different things to, to get to the level that he is. You know, all of those different feathers in his hat eventually made him who he was. And speaking of Instagram, uh, since it has completely, really taken over the welding community, um, and it's actually a, a, a very excellent tool that a lot of welders have uh, come to use to either get business or get their name out there to get them even jobs. Um, what are some of the techniques that you guys use on social media to, to really get your work and, and your message out there to people? Any one of you. You jump in first, Joe. Oh, well. I have a YouTube channel, and I guess the only thing that pops into my head is I try to I try to put it out there the way I'd want to receive it. You know, you try got to put yourself in the other person's shoes. Mm-hmm. Am I talking too long? Am I giving enough information? Am I giving too much information? Just try to try to put something out there that you would want to consume and uh, that you could learn from. And uh, you know, usually if you put something out there like that, it just takes care of itself it kind of rises up in the ranks on the on the rankings and how it's served up and everything and and the effect that it has because if you you put your heart and soul into something and you really want your intent is kind of for lack of a better word your intent is pure um, it'll probably have the desired effect that person will learn from it people will benefit from it and you will too mm-hmm. you know? yeah anything i'm kind of a greenhorn on instagram i do post uh weld pictures stuff that goes on in our shop daily i mean i try to get the students involved and compare some work so we put out sample welds that we're doing at the time uh 
but I also put out a golf video or something of my son swinging the ball or swinging the club or whatever. I mean, I don't, I don't treat my account as pure welding or pure promotion of, you know, sample welds or anything like that. Uh, I like to look at a lot of different stuff. I follow Ian, and I'm amazed. I asked him the other day, what do you use to do these fantastic wide-angle shots of these Jeeps out in the, out in the desert and stuff? And he goes, my phone. And I thought it was some special wide-angle lens because these pictures are, like, beautiful. But I'm learning, you know, what, some of these techniques of, of – and I have a, for, a photography background, and I have some decent equipment, but it's like – manipulating some lighting and making something look abstract maybe in the in the macro or the the grain structure of a weld or something like that so i you know instagram is extremely powerful uh people have gotten a hold of me at all hours of the day and night asking advice and i that's fine if i can help them i certainly will Mm -hmm. uh and then i've asked questions i've i've contacted people at times over instagram private message because I need something. I don't know it all, and so I need to. I need help with something, a little technique or something that I thought was cool. How do you do that? You know, I'm not gonna. I don't want to go on and copy it, but I might want to use that tool or use how that concept or something, and maybe create something for myself a little bit different. So Instagram is, Instagram is fun. It's powerful, and I agree with you on that welding part of it because we can we share technique. There's some beautiful pictures out there, and oh, most of, and most of them aren't mine. Mine either, man. <laughs> Can I say something real quick? Go ahead. Uh, if you're a welder and you're not on Instagram, you're missing out. One of the better welding communities I've ever seen is on Instagram. A lot of willingness to help, share information, help each other. And, and, that's just, and also it's just inspirational and humbling at the same time. The quality of work that's being done out there is amazing. The information being shared on Instagram is amazing. So I'd encourage you to get on if you're not on. I was late to the party getting on. But I'm glad I did. I'd agree with that. I think Jody's right. I think the the reality is with social media is 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 it, it legitimately has removed any and all barriers for any type of promotion or public display of anything. So that's good and bad. You know, if you're selling flat tummy tea, that's what you want to do. But if you can keep your daughter from doing that, you get an A as a parent. <laughs> but um, so we, uh, I, I the the only advice I would give anybody on Instagram, I agree with Jody. It's a great platform. Uh, probably the best advice I'd have, the same thing I'd give my son, I'd like, be the same person online that you want to be in real life. And that's just the truth, you know? Because I think, uh, I mean, my if you're on my Instagram account, yeah, there's some welding, yeah, there's some Jeeps, there's occasionally a glass of whiskey, because that's what I enjoy. And there's a bunch of other stuff, you know? So I think that, you know, I think that's just the best advice I can give anyone is it is a great platform, but it's better if it's actually you. Yeah, make if, it yours. Yeah, yeah. If, it, if, if you're the type of, and, and if, if you want to ask questions, you know, it's the same thing. I've, that's a, where we first met was through Instagram, and uh-huh. you and I have probably talked many times on Instagram. I've had problems with some of my uh, some of the setups or stuff. I've hit at, sent out to everybody that I know on Instagram. I'm like, listen, this is legitimately what happened. What did I do wrong? And we send messages back and forth. It's a great sort of like introductory place if you don't know someone's phone number and you can't text them, which is which is great. But I do firmly believe that the best thing you can do is, you know, and, and don't be that guy. And the other thing about Instagram, which is, and it's, it's, it's just the way it is, it's the world. When someone will post up, and you've seen it, I've seen it, we've all seen it, someone will post up and be like, hey, what's wrong with this weld? This is my first time welding. You don't need 100 comments of put down the welder. Yes. You know, because the reality is everyone did their first weld at some point in time. Unfortunately, that person posted it online. <laughs> I was fortunate enough there was no online when I did my first weld. Amen. No one got to see it. Yep. <laughs> So, so make it you, make it real, and don't be afraid to show your failures as well. Oh, absolutely you know, that, that not. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's a machine. Nobody's putting out absolute perfect stuff all the time. Showing your failures shows your learning as well. And if people want to go along that journey with you. You know, they want to see your failures. Show that. It's very, very important because nobody's perfect yeah, at well, all. We're, I make the joke whenever we're doing demos, especially at the SEMA show, because a lot of their, it's a lot of rookie welders at the SEMA show. I'll tell them, I'll say, I'll set you up for the ultimate Instagram weld, and you'll be good. And we set up a nice little T-joint on stainless. You got a nice little rest for the cup. All that shielding gas will just boil back and forth. Just leave that, and you, it looks like a unicorn fart. It's got that nice gold, blue, yellow. Yeah, yeah. You just take a picture of that, post it on Instagram. Life's good for you. Just hashtag that, weld porn. <laughs> It's all done. Boom. <laughs> over. Famous. <laughs> all right. Before we uh, turn questions over to our media people here in the front, let's give these guys a round of applause for an excellent panel. 
All right. Uh, opened up to questions to people here in the front row. Who wants to go first? Robert, you look eager. <laughs> what do they think of when they hear the phrase? Here you go. What do you think of when you hear the phrase production welder? Production welder? Production welder, when I just hear the phrase, it's like, that's somebody in a factory cranking out piecework. Same weld, day in, day out, all day long. That's, that's the first impression. However, I know there's other definitions of that production welder. Anybody? Pretty much the same thing here. Initially, what comes to mind is just pulling the trigger on a MIG gun and holding on and, you know, blow and go. But I know people who would technically are production welders or have been, there's a whole lot more to it, like some big stainless computer cabinet that's, you know, it's eight feet long by six feet wide and it's got to be held within 15,000 tolerance. It's a little different, but he's still a production welder. It's just that uh, it's all over the board, but if you're, if you're going for it, there seems to be a little bit of a misperception, and that there's a lot of that. But uh, all production welders aren't the same, I guess. Yeah, yeah I 100% agree with that. Really, they're not. Um, you know, it, you're right. When people hear production welding, they think you know the the lower pay, menial job, or you're just pumping out parts. Um, and that's true. There is that part of it, but there is also the very high dollar part. You know, where you could be doing an order of uh, 50 military grade pumps. And that's technically production. You have to put out those at military spec, though. You know, and that, that's technically production welding as well. So, anybody else? I'm here, Mike. How do I avoid production welding? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you can't. Sometimes that's your that's your first rung of the ladder. Just try not to stay there. Yeah. It's a good place to start, great place to visit. You don't want to live there. I would say it's the same as every job. Every job's got an entry-level point, and there are people who stay at an entry-level point in any job. You know, it's like that guy doing burgers, but next week it's the fries. You know, that's just the reality. Um, I think if you, if, you, if you get there and have that mindset that this is where I am and this is where I'm going to be, that's where you're going to stay. And that's just the truth. That's any job. Hey, wait a minute. I just thought of something. I like being a production welder. <laughs> By the true definition of a piece worker, I like, I like it, really. I had, a, I had a buddy of mine that I went to school with. His dad's a, dad was into cars and stuff. His dad was a, a brain cells just exude out of these, this whole family. Their IQs are off the charts. And his dad was a geophysicist at Conoco. Don't ask me to spell that right now. Um, <clears throat> And Dion had called me up one winter time. He had he kind of connected with me on Facebook after all these years. I, was, I coached him when he was in engineering school at Oklahoma State. I was coaching the Oklahoma State bowling team. And so we rode back and forth from Stillwater to Punk City, and we'd talk, and I'd go, uh, hey, what did you do this week? And he'd go, oh, I designed a six-speed transmission. A mathematical genius, you know. Anyway, we, after high school and our careers and in junior college and whatnot, we were kind of disconnected, but he hit me up on Facebook. Texas Instruments paid for his junior and senior year at Oklahoma State University if they would if he agreed to come on board with them. And so he would he worked for them for like seven years. Now they're one of his customers. He owns his own company and he was bidding on some military parts. He doesn't know how to he doesn't know the specs. So he called me up and I'm helping him out. I was on winter break and I'm helping him out with this spec. I'm looking at the print. I'm telling him what to avoid, what to ignore what you really need to pay attention to. And, I, and then I said, well, here's how I'd bid on it if it was me. Because a small, intricate, tight tolerance welds and stuff. And he calls me up two weeks later and he goes, man, I got another problem. And I'm going, now what? And he goes, well, I bid on this project like you said. And I bid it high like you said. And nobody in Dallas wants to weld on it. And I said, well, start cutting parts. I'm on my way. So I loaded up some equipment, and I headed to his house, unloaded Friday night. We went to dinner, and I'm welding starting Saturday morning, and I'm on some small stuff. <clears throat> what, the, what, the, what these parts were was essentially a, an AWAC radar mount for a Humvee, okay? So, and his parts are absolutely impeccable. They are perfect. He built a jig, and you don't even need to clamp parts down. They're, everything fits so nice. And so I'm over there and I'm welding on these parts and he goes, uh, 
hey, I bid those at 25 bucks. Can you keep me under that? And I said, yeah, you bet. How about 20? Is that fair? He goes, yeah. I said, well, you need to crank up those machines because I'm making one every five minutes. <laughs> I'll do $20 every five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Production worker. <laughs> Any other questions? No? All right. Oh, we got one in the back. Oh. Hello. Um, I'm currently just getting in. I'm actually in a technical college still. What would you uh, advise me on for welding, uh, getting in the industry, which I've not actually stepped in, and anything else related to it, if you can? Basically, new to the industry, just getting into it, what advice would you give them? My advice would be, uh, this might not be the job you do for the rest of your life, even though you really, and, and never, and never, don't think that's a bad thing, you know? Like, when I was a high school student, I wanted to be a mechanic. I was not going to be a teacher. That was my parents' jobs. And, but then I became a teacher, and I did that. And then I, some fool said they'd put me on television if I built trucks, and then I did that. I think the most, I always say to people, the job you choose today might not be the job that you have tomorrow, and there's nothing wrong with that. Just find a job that you like and uh, understand that everyone could always use an extra 20 bucks, so it doesn't matter how much it pays, just do a job you like and live inside that dollar figure and have fun. Go ahead. Always, once you get that first job, now you're on a path, keep your eyes open, scan the horizon, because opportunities will come along because now you're in the game. If you're just focused on or thinking you're stuck and you, and you can't see the horizon, you know, you won't see those opportunities. But if you keep your eye out for them, if you're always looking for them, you'll probably see them or recognize them when they come along. Take them. It may not be a good one, but you don't have to stay there forever either, you know. But usually one opportunity leads to another. Uh, don't get some sick sense of loyalty that you have to stay in that entry-level job because they – you, you appreciate them hiring you. As long as you give eight hours for eight hours pay, that's the loyalty right there. Move on when the opportunity comes. This craft is somewhat dynamic and keep an open mind to what's available as far as, I mean, you, you could get into sales and make some really good money. Relationships come and go. Parlay those relationships and, uh, you know, kind of explore some possibilities. You have a passion for design, maybe get into some CNC working with exotics or something so I mean you get into inspection sales uh, yeah, there's just there's just all kinds of stuff in within this trade or this craft so some opportunities I'm just gonna lean right over here and there we go um, you're talking a little bit about the the, the skills uh, the pay skills gap kind of thing do you think we're going to lose a lot of like talented people in the industry because there's a problem with like, getting the pay that really, you know, you get somebody who gets to a certain level of their skill, you're going to stay in the industry, we're going to lose them. How do we, how do we avoid that? Oh, me? All right. Uh, yeah, I, I honestly think you will. You will. If it's not addressed and it's not fixed soon, uh, you are. You are going to see lots and lots of talented people taking off and going into other avenues of, of making money. Um, because why would you stay in an area where, A, you're not appreciated in your check or appreciated at your job? Uh, and it is, it is a part of the ugly truth of the industry. You know, um, It's almost insulting some of the wages that are out there for welders right now. Uh, guys that are extremely talented, extremely certified. Um, you know, we, we almost have an issue where you can't become a journeyman welder unless you are in the, uh, the iron workers union. Um, but yet alone, I mean, we have how many certifications for welders outside of the union? You have how many guys that are, you know, journeyman level, but can't achieve that without getting into the union. And the union is something that is, you know, I know in a lot of areas, especially in back in my hometown in Detroit, is an area where it's the good old boys crew. You know, you have to know somebody to get in. It's not who's the best guy for the job anymore. Um, and that deters a lot of people from it. They're like, I've been in this for so long, I've been trying for so long, but I don't know the right people to get into this job, so I'm gonna go and do something else. And unfortunately, you see that happening more and more and more and more. Um, 
you know, I, I've discussed this with my buddy Josh Welton many a times. You know, we almost need our own welders union, just like the electricians have their own union, the plumbers have their own union, the carpenters have their own union. They're all given journeyman level licenses at a certain point, and they all receive journeyman pay scale, where you got the guy that works in the shop that is exactly that level, has to meet code, and you know, can't make his bills at the end of the day because he's not being paid a journeyman level wage. You know, the, the, the income inequality when it comes to that is, is frankly, you can quote me on this, disgusting. It is, it's absolutely disgusting. And we need to do something about that before, I mean, at least to, to start getting people more interested in this. You know, like we discussed earlier, why would you do this when you could go work at this and make the same comparable wage? That's in the beginning. If it starts in the beginning, we can fix it in the future. All right. Oh, we, got well, we got one more. All right. What's your take on robots coming into the industry? Skynet, bro. I think it's I think it's pronounced robots. 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 The robots. Oh, they that was just the first thing. It's pronounced robots. They just production workers. <laughs> they do what we tell them. It's a production. <laughs> We control the robots. Yeah. <laughs> um, personally, I think the, the, the rise that you're seeing in automation is the answer to what we're talking about earlier about how you can't find people to get into these jobs. You can't find people to fill the work. So they are hiring robots now and, and buying robots to do, not hiring robots, but buying robots to do the job. I hire robots. Yeah, I hire robots too. Yeah. You know? <laughs> But, uh, you know, and, and in, in, a, in a small section of that, it's not like they're coming to ticker jobs or anything like that. But, you know, they are creating jobs in, in a certain way. But at the same time, times are changing. You know, uh, there's, there's the, the classic example of the guy that made the wagon wheel. OK, then the car was invented. That guy had to figure out how to adapt and adapt quick if he was going to stay making money. You know, it's the same thing with this, this rise of automation. The, the robots are coming. They are not going to stop. It's up to you to stay ahead of the curve and stay educated enough and skilled enough that you beat them. If you really understand the welding process being used by that robot and you're the guy that can learn how to program that robot, your stock just went up. You're, you're a very valuable asset to that company because a lot of robot programmers will not understand the process, the welding process, and when that part goes wrong, they got mucho defects, cost a lot of money, but and so they need somebody that used to be a welder and maybe wanted to expand their horizons a little bit and now, want, now can program robots. So opportunities come along with what, what seems like, a, you know, is, is a killing jobs, but there are opportunities that come along with that. Yeah, I also think if you look at a global scale and, and, and just history in general, there was a time when we actually used to build cars by hand too, but we don't do that anymore. But there are still people out there who build cars by hand. They just cost a half million dollars. There's a difference. So yeah, the robots are there. The robots will always be there to make a Kia, but when it comes time to build a Lamborghini, there's like 20 guys in white coats. So there's, I think that just speaks to what Jody was saying. There's still, there's gonna be a robot skill level and then a completely other skill level on top of that. We good? I have a question. You have a question? I have a question. All right. I was honored to be on your podcast quite some time back with Scott Robbie. Yeah. Um, and the, the other gentleman from uh, Detroit area, Bulldog Welding, is that yes, correct? Bull, yes, yeah. Okay. And uh, had a hard time getting a hold of you there for a while. Sorry? I had a hard time getting a hold of you for a while. You work nights, huh? Yeah. What's your story? Because it's a good one. What are you involved in? See, a lot of people think Jimmy is like got the superior radio voice and that's all he does. But let's talk about your welding career. All right. Well, uh, my welding career, uh, bringing back to production welding, I paid my dues in production welding for seven years. Um, when I started in this, uh, Instagram wasn't around, YouTube wasn't around. Uh, the information to get to the level you needed to get in your career wasn't as available as it is now. Now it's, just, it's a fast highway to wherever you need to go as far as the information. Um, back when I started, there was, you know, you heard whispers of, uh, you know, Pipeliner, or uh, you heard guys, uh, you know, out on the oil rigs, just just making massive, massive money, and we're like, how do you get there? You know, so you felt. Uh, I talk about it all the time. You know, you're stuck in a bubble. 
where this is the process you learn. And I was just a MIG welder uh, for seven years. And I'm, I'm like, I got to figure out a way to learn TIG. I got to get a job that's going to teach me to learn TIG because I don't have the money to get to a trade school. And I'm not, uh, I don't have good credit or a cosign or anything else that can get me the education I need uh, to, to go to a trade school for that. Um, then, unfortunately, what, well, but fortunately, but unfortunately, what gave me uh, that next jump was the Afghanistan war. When the Afghanistan war happened, they were taking welders. If you basically, I mean, forget my words, but if you had the balls to go, they were going to hire you. It didn't matter what skill level you were. Uh, I got a, <laughs> a six-figure job on a 2F weld cert. That was it. I did that weld cert. I was hired immediately, and I was sent over there. Then they took my education level from this level of welding to this level of welding, and it was Army training. So there was no bull crap in that whatsoever. Uh, and I'm forever grateful to you know the, the service for giving me that. I did not serve. I worked for them. Um, I spent a couple months in Afghanistan uh, welding uh, MRAP vehicles for them. And then I came back, and I was hired again to go to Kuwait. And I went to Kuwait for a couple months, and I worked for them uh, building same MRAC vehicles. And then when I came back, with that clout being on my resume, I was then able to get a job into the aerospace and defense industry back home in Detroit. And I've been in aerospace ever since then. And basically, my whole night is you know TIG welding uh, either aluminum or I work on uh, a steel called Invar, which is a, a high nickel alloy that's very, very toxic. but it pays to be able to weld on that. And uh, that's, that's what I've done you know, for 15 years now. I've, I've been a welder, so half of it, I've paid my dues in production welding. So like I said, there's nothing wrong with it. It sucks, but you learn how good it is once you get out and you can appreciate it that much more. Uh, but that, that's, that's basically my history. That's, that's what I do day in, day out, seven days a week, 12 hours a day most of the time. Now we know, yeah. Jimmy McKnight. <laughs> All right. All right, well, I think, uh, I think that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for watching this very special, uh, thank you, very special Art Junkies Live. Give these guys a round of applause one more time. And enjoy your fab tech. And until next time, work safe and weld hard. <laughs>